Introducing speakers at the Ulrich is always a real pleasure and honor for me. Um, and yet I have to share with you that introducing Michael Brenson is an imposing challenge. Such is his long shadow over the art world and 40 years of writing and the intelligence and thoughtfulness that he brings to the artists and the subjects that he inspects. He was leading art critic at the New York Times in the 1980s, was there for nine years. He is the author of over 20 books, although very honestly, that's a number that's hard to pin down and quantify, given that there are many more volumes to which he was a contributor or with an essay or an article that was in it. He's a critic as well as an art historical scholar and a curator. And his interests with these various publications and projects have been really quite wide ranging and with very, very different artists from people such as Maya Lin to Louise Jimenez, from Henri Cartier Bierson to Magdalena Abakanovic, really just uh, across the entire spectrum. During the 1990s culture wars, and some of us in the room may remember um, those years, and it was the moment when the National Endowment for the Arts almost uh, went down. Brenson was a leading voice. He has several books that are, is devoted specifically to the role of arts and culture and the role that they need to play in our democracy. Acts of Engagement is the title of his anthology that collected his essays from 1993 to 2002. And, and just as an insight to that, I thought I would read you this blurb. His, you know, any book has sort of blurbs on the back cover on the dust jacket at, at any rate. But this was one that was written by Sarah Lynn Reese Hardy. A couple of us in the room know her. She's the current director of the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of Kansas. For a bit, she was the director of the museum program for the National Endowment for the Arts. And she said, give this book to everyone you know, Ex exclamation point. Defining the central questions of culture in America, Brenson offers an invitation to step into the fray with inspired language born of deep insight, broad experience, and moral compass. Acts of engagement reveals, defines, and activates the crucial artistic questions of our time. Quite high praise. Um, I bet a couple of us are walking out to Watermark um, over the weekend to see if we can't pick it up. Uh, Brent, uh, Brenson will speak this evening about the sculptor uh, David Smith, sculpture, and in particular, the work of the Swift sculpture painter Alberto Giacometti looms very large in Brenson's uh, bibliography. As a matter of fact, his PhD from John Hopkins is devoted to this Swiss master, and he came to know of David Smith during his research on the sculptor um, Giacometti. And he's been working on a biography, therefore, for this artist for a long time. Long time. <laughs> many years, and, and yet uh, apparently the stories he's been a little private about all of that, and he's nearing a point or is at a point where he is now willing to sort of share some of his insights and, and perspectives, so we are among the lucky firsts. Please help me to welcome Michael Brenson to Wichita and to the stage. Thank you, wow. Thank you for inviting me to the Ulrich and uh, it's my first visit to Wichita and glad to be here. Um, let me give you some idea of what you're gonna be hearing. I, I've been asked to, let me turn this on too. Okay, uh, I've been asked to give a number of lectures in Kansas this month and uh, thinking about what what I could talk about. Um, it, it comes back to David Smith because I've been working on a biography for, as we said, a long time. Uh, and I'm always trying to find time for it around teaching. And um, But I was thinking what could I, how could I talk about this in such a way that would be interesting to people uh, 
to an audience that didn't know about Smith and maybe you know didn't know that much about the the art world because I know some people really know about him and some people don't. And what I thought I would do then, I thought I would really try to zero in on questions of biography because I've been living with this thing for a while and and there are problems, there are challenges in writing biography that that are quite haunting to me and and issues that I lived through, that I've lived through in a pretty solitary way for some time. And um, so that's really in part what this is. It's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's about biography, uh, and it, the, the last half of it is really about little questions of biography, narrative questions, and I wanted to give a kind of talk that 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 I hope that you could respond to, uh, you know, present material in in a way that would be, or present material that would be interesting, and present it in such a way that when it was done, that I that I hope you would have responses to, uh, um, you know, to to these kinds of situations or the kinds of problems that I'm going to be presenting you with. So, I am really interested in a in a give and take here, and and I hope you know I'm available after the talk for. For anything you want to say, and I hope that the talk is provocative enough to to make you want to speak. Roland David Smith was born in Decatur, Indiana in 1906, roughly 70 years after his great-great-grandfather-in-law helped settle the town. When he was 15, his family moved 50 miles northeast to the smaller town of Paulding, Ohio where his father Harv, during Smith's childhood a telephone linesman as well as a part-time inventor, became half owner of the Paulding Telephone Company. After a dismal freshman year at Ohio University, Smith took a summer job on the assembly line at the Studebaker factory in South Bend. Riveter on frame assembly worked on lathe soldering jig spot welder is the way he described his job in a 1947 biographical sketch. In 1926, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he worked in the Morris, Morris Plan Bank and took two poetry courses at night at George Washington University. In the fall, he moved to New York City. He was 20 years old. Decatur and Paulding to New York to become an artist was not exactly a well-trodden career path. One of the other residents of his rooming house near Columbia University was another aspiring artist named Dorothy Daner. Born in 1901 and raised in Ohio, after her father's death, her family moved to Pasadena, California because of the tubercular condition of her older sister and the, rheumatic, the rheumatoid arthritis of her mother. By the time Daner was 17, her mother and sister too had died. She danced and then acted in the Pasadena Playhouse. She too moved to New York at 20. When they met, she was vastly more sophisticated than he. On Christmas Eve 1927, they got married. She directed him to the Art Students League where they studied painting and drawing. One of Smith's teachers was the Ashcan painter and political firebrand John Sloan. Both Smith and Daner studied with the Czech painter Jan Matulka. Great Awakening of Cubism, wrote, Smith wrote in 1947. Matoka was the kind of a teacher that would say, you got to make abstract art, got to hear music of Stravinsky. Have you read The Red and the Black, Stondal? Matoka was a guy I'd rather give more credit than anyone else. In the summer of 1929, Smith and Daner visited Weber and Thomas Furlong, friends from the League, in Bolton Landing in the Adirondack Mountains, 220 miles north of New York City. For $3,000, Dana bought an 80-acre former fox farm and its ramshackle structures. The Furlongs had introduced Smith and Dana to Smith's other great mentor, the flamboyantly eccentric Russian emigre painter John Graham, whose wife Eleanor would soon buy her and John a place at Bolden Landing. After seeing reproductions of the welded steel constructions of Pablo Picasso and Julio Gonzalez, Smith had an epiphany. Since I'd worked in factories and made parts of automobiles and had worked on telephone lines, I saw a chance to make sculpture in a tradition I was already rooted in. 
In a garage in Bolton Landing with borrowed equipment, he began welding sculpture. With found industrial parts affixed to flat paint, planes, his first welded sculptures reflect his wit and ceremonial energy and his awareness of cubist collage. In 1934, Smith began making sculpture in the Terminal Ironworks, a blacksmith's shop in the ferry terminal five minutes from their Brooklyn Heights apartment. Smith had his first solo show at Manhattan's East River Gallery in 1938. Buckhorn and Blackburn, who ran the Terminal Ironworks, came to the opening. In 1935 and 1936, Smith and Daner spent nearly 10 months in Europe including a couple of months in Paris and six months in Athens and visiting Russia. We were very politically aware, Daner said, and we felt that certainly a war was coming and that Hitler would start something terrible in Europe, and we wanted to see it before it was all smashed up. In 1940, they moved to Bolton Landing. We left New York just before the project broke up, Daner said. Congress really beat it to death, and they were investigating everybody, and they were investigating our friends, and they would come and sit in the house and ask questions about different artists that we knew, and it was all terribly unpleasant. In Bolton Landing, they could make art and avoid distractions and live like pioneers. Pretty much everyone who visited experienced life there as remote. In his 1956 article on Smith, Eugene Goosen characterized their place as an outpost. From the moment he emerged as a sculptor, Smith projected an almost irresistible image of a new kind of artist, an artist worker, physically imposing, down to earth, as much at home in shop talk with blacksmiths as he was discussing classical music, Picasso and Joyce. Oh David, you're as delicate as Vivaldi and as strong as a Mack truck, Robert Motherwell wrote in Vogue in February 1965. Bell Krasny's 1952 profile of Smith in Art Digest begins, if you think you saw David Smith, the big burly welded artist dealers, dealer recently observed, you saw David Smith. An apt description for Smith is as, as conspicuous as a Hemingway character at high tea. Temperamentally and physically bullish, alien to the city, he lives on a 100-acre tract of land overlooking Lake George in the Adirondacks in upstate New York. There he hunts, fishes, farms, cooks, and brews his own beer. There too, with an acetylene torch, he makes highly personal, highly abstract sculpture. Sculpture the general public doesn't much care for, but then Smith doesn't much care for the general public. When I asked the painter Alfred Leslie what he believed people most needed to know about Smith, he said, his intellectual life, the depth of the kind of thinking that went into his work. Daner fled Smith in 1950. Three years later, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, he married Jean Fries, half his age, whom he had met while teaching at Sarah Lawrence College in 1949. Their daughters, Rebecca and Candida, were born in 1954 and 1955, respectively. When Fries, too, fled him, in 1958, the year after his solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, she took their daughters with her to Washington, D.C., her hometown. In a memoir of their years together, Fries cited a passage in one of his letters before their marriage. Oh Christ, he wrote after a serious quarrel, why can't I make life like I can make sculpture? It was a question he would raise many times. For his 1962 sculpture in the city, for his festival exhibition, for his festival of two worlds in Spoleto, Italy, the curator Giovanni Carandente arranged for Smith to be given access to a recently abandoned Ital Cedar Steel factory in the town of Voltri, just west of Genoa. Half a dozen workmen were assigned to help him. He didn't speak Italian nor they English, but Smith believed they understood one another perfectly providing him with proof of the fruitfulness of nonverbal communication among men in which he had wanted to believe since he was a child. He wrote beautifully about Voltry. A factory stripped of its function, leaves on the floor from holes in the roof, 
quiet except for a bird cheep. From factory to factory, I laid out workbenches. I finished two there, let more. I felt the awe and the scared air, like one returning survivor after Holocaust. And as I had felt very young in Decatur, when I went through the window in my first abandoned factory. After the first shock of its immensity and the privilege, I felt at home and then to work. Like the other 13 sculptors chosen for the show, he was supposed to make one or two sculptures. He made 26 in 30 days. Karen Dente saw them as Smith did, as a triumph. He installed almost all of them in the town's Roman amphitheater. Most of the other sculptures in the exhibition were installed in the streets, which helped make the Festival of Two Worlds a public art landmark. The month in Italy may have been the happiest moment of Smith's life. Karen Denti agreed to have unused factory parts shipped back to Bolton Landing, where Smith continued to combine them with local objects in hybrid totalities or new, to use his word, unities. Smith is lumped in with other abstract expressionists as brawling, swearing, hard-drinking, womanizing, macho men. Brawling, never. Swearing, yes. Macho, yes, but. Smith was not a womanizer and did not become a hard drinker until after Freeze left him. He was 52 then. During his last seven years, he drank more, sought young women, and struggled with loneliness to which the seemingly most independent of men was excruciatingly susceptible. Long distrustful of museums and determined to provide his own context for his work, he kept planning sculptures around his house and studio. He could decide when they would leave and return. The sculptures were sentinels, circles, portals, and totems. Dan Budnick's photographs of Smith Fields, Fields have been as haunting to subsequent generations of American artists as Robert Smithson's photographs of the spiral jetty. On May 23, 1965, driving to a student party near Bennington, Vermont, Smith lost control of his Dodge panel truck and smashed into a telephone pole. In the ambulance speeding him to the Albany Medical Center, he died. He was 59. Smith considered Pollock his main rival. Daner said that when Smith visited Pollock on Long Island in midsummer 1950, Pollock told him, look, Dave, you're the best sculptor and I'm the best painter. He number one boy in painting, me number one boy in sculpture, Smith said to Freeze a few years later. Unlike Pollock, who took a young woman with him in his suicidal recklessness, Smith was driving alone. Interviewed for his 1969 Smith retrospective at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the curator Edward F. Fry said that Smith's was the most extraordinary artistic career that this country has ever known. Smith's work is filled with biographical evidence. On many sculptures after 1950, sculptures after 1950, near the welded signature, usually on the base, but occasionally higher up on a silver slab, he welded a date. The continuum of dates helped build into the work a diaristic momentum. Each day something can demand form, each day a new image or new thing can declare its existence. A number of Smith's sculptures, drawings, and paintings include the names of people close to him, most often Rebecca and Candida, but also artist friends like the painter Kenneth Noland and the sculptor James, Riz sculptor James Rosati. No title names his devout Methodist mother, Golda Stoller, but titles such as Widow's Lament, Specter of Mother, and Pillar of Sunday write into the work her indelible presence. Smith photographed some of his sculptures at the edge of Bolton Landing's Lake George Dock. He photographed pretty much all his sculptures on his mountainside property. For decades, his photographs were the ones used to reproduce his sculptures in newspapers and magazines. Often, they accompanied his exhibitions. No matter where the sculptures were shown, Smith's photographs communicated that their first home was not there in galleries and museums, but where they were made, both an actual place where the artist lived and a new and as yet untouched world. 
Until the 90s, few writers on Smith realized that their interpretation of his work was shaped by his photographic image of it. Only in the last six years did I realize how much I, too, was guided by these photographs, having fallen in love with them, somehow assuming or wanting to believe that Smith's photographic vision of his sculpture and the actual sculpture coincided. Excuse me. That Smith was able to persuade critic after critic, scholar after scholar, to experience his photographs as the work is significant, almost magical an indication of a persuasive intelligence that is a dimension of his talent. When Smith tried to understand another artist, he turned to biography. He read Janet Flanner's profiles of Picasso and Matisse in The New Yorker. He liked the bilingual French art magazine, L'Oi, I, which began in 1954, many of whose articles on artists merged personality, life, and art. In preparation for the one article he wrote on another artist in 1955 for Art News on Julio Gonzalez, Smith spent as much time trying to learn about the man as he did thinking about his work. His questions could be remarkable. He wrote the French-American painter and printmaker Henri Goetz, I'm looking for the gentle intimacies which artists know about each other and which relate to their work in the unofficial museum way. It's the sort of thing the painter Herman Cherry and I talk about. I don't aim to prove anything or draw moral conclusions or make a classified rating. I'd like to know things about his nature, his battle for existence, whether the French gave him his due, how he fared with the dealers, the nature of his wife, her sympathy and encouragement, his intimate friends, whether he liked Kandinsky and Mondrian, whether he liked music and what kind, the cafes he went to and with whom he talked art. He must have been discouraged at times for lack of reception, how he took it or if he mentioned it, and did he feel that he would eventually be recognized? Was he ever bitter? How did he keep the workshop going? Materials and gas cost money, more than paint and canvas, as I well know. Did he want tools and materials that he couldn't afford? What kind of sacrifices did his family have to make to keep him at work? Smith wrote the painter John Ciceron, the French texts on Gonzales talk about his withdrawal and secrecy, but it could not have been wholly so, for he attended Circle and Square Circle et Carré was the name of a group of abstract artists in Paris in the early 30s in which uh, Ciceron and Graham participated. Was he secret or just quiet? Did he talk much or did he just listen? Whom did he like to talk with most or listen to? In writings between 1947 and 1952, Smith referred several times to Ernst Chris a psychoanalyst and writer on art with whom he would actually consult shortly before Chris's death in 1957. Fries said that when he emerged from this session, he felt so completely understood that he was crying. In 1947, he quoted from Approaches to Art, a Chris essay in Psychoanalysis Today, an anthology given to Dana in 1946 by a friend. Chris, Smith said, says that his work means more to the artist than the product of their labor means to other men. The relationship of the artist to his work is complex and subject to many variations. In the typical case, the work becomes part of and is ever more important than the self. In psychoanalytic terms, we speak of a shift of narcissistic cathexis from the person of the artist to his work. The dictionary definition of cathexis is concentration of psychic energy on some particular person, thing, idea, or aspect of the self. Chris's next two sentences are, if this shift outlasts the process of creation, the work gains a permanent place in the artist's life, and we speak of the artist's work as of his child. In extreme cases, the artist might find it difficult to part from what he created. Later in 1947, in another talk, echoing these words, Smith said, 
that while an artist's work may mean more to him than the product of their labor may mean to other men, and the product may always remain his child, the artist needs responses to confirm his belief in his own work. Exhibiting is necessary to reach the responsive part of the public. Exhibiting with museums and societies offers little economic salvation. In most societies, in some museums, an exhibition fee is levied, which when added to the expense of packing, shipping, and insuring, makes the artist pay dearly to show his child. In their 1934 book, Legend, Myth, and Magic in the Image of the Artist, a Historical Experiment, Chris and Otto Kurtz report this anecdote. When asked why he had never married, Michelangelo indicated that his works were his children. Chris and Kurtz understood, underlined the cultural importance of the artist's biography and defined patterns in it that emerged in ancient Greece. They include rising from humble beginnings, eruptions of talent in childhood that someone felicitously noticed, sharp rivalries with other artists, and the intimate life and death bond linking an artist to his work. The patterns also include a capacity for image magic, for making images that can be worshipped as more real than the gods they are intended to visualize, the artist's ability to cross boundaries and gain access to godly or demonic knowledge can make him or her both irresistible and illicit, mesmerizing and dangerous, admired and feared. Painters and sculptors are descendants of cultural heroes, Chris wrote, experts in many skills, masters of many secrets of nature. These heroes competed with the gods. Prometheus who created man, Hephaestus and Daedalus who created moving automatons of man. They and their counterparts in Nordic and, or Central Asiatic traditions were punished by the gods for their transgression of divine prerogatives. Chris and Kurt cite Durer's characterization, characterization of artistic creativity as creating just as God did. They point out that the myth of the hero has now been joined by a myth of the artist. This myth is woven into the fabric of biography. The heroization of the artist has become the aim of his biographers. Historiography, having once accepted the legacy of myth, is never fully able to break its spell. Biographies depend upon anecdote. My Webster's Dictionary defines anecdote as one originally little known entertaining facts of history or biography, two, a short entertaining account of some happening, usually personal or biographical, synonym, story, incident, tale, narrative, narration. Chris and Kurtz provide a more substantial definition. As a rule, the anecdote deals with a prominent person or a hero, or it substitutes a particular social type who is brought closer to our understanding so that we can identify with him more easily. Hence, what is related about the hero is mostly to be regarded as a gloss upon his official biography and presents the great man as one with human foibles or else shows his adroitness in a, in a new and unexpected light. One could call the anecdote an episode from the secret life of the hero. Here we seem to touch upon the oldest meaning of the word, which deriving from the Greek, and I can't pronounce it, is still used in its antiquated sense to designate something new, unknown, and therefore secret. Around 20 years after Smith's death, Daner described an incident that occurred in, in just January 1928, the first month of their marriage. David's mother had not ever met us, me, or us as a married couple, and she sent us a chicken from Paulding, Ohio, a raw chicken, in those days, the mail was so good that it wouldn't possibly spoil. It was special delivery and everything. We got this chicken, and she sent the whole dinner. She had sweet potatoes. They weren't cooked yet, you see. Nothing was cooked with cranberry sauce, strawberry jam, and things. I made our first real feast that day. There was the chicken, and I put little ruffles like the French do. I cut them, you know. We didn't drink wine. It was prohibition, I guess. But anyhow, we drank milk. I'd put two glasses of milk on it at our place because we always had a glass of milk with our dinner. We were still babies. 
And I said to David, okay, it's all ready. He came into the little dining part of the kitchen, which was a little separate from the kitchen itself, and he bumped against the table, and he knocked over the milk. I said, oh, David. And he took the tablecloth, and he threw the whole dinner. The chicken and the gravy and the strawberry jam and the cranberry sauce went all over the floor. He ran out, and the next time I saw him, he came in with two men who had pulled him out of the Hudson River, where he had flung himself next to a barge. There were ice flows in the Hudson River. This was about a week after we were married, and his clothes were frozen on him. I had only twice seen ice flows this far, this far south on the Hudson River. I'd seen it a lot up in the Albany area, but not down here, twice in all the years I've been here. His clothes were frozen on him. I took his clothes off. The men said, we pulled him out. We happened to be standing right there. They pulled him out. I hope he had seen them. He was just flinging himself, you know. I suppose he thought I was reprimanding him like his mother did and like his father did. He told me his father used to whip him. But his sister Catherine has no memory of that. But of course she's younger and it might have been executed elsewhere. But he was obviously very uncomfortable at home, just the opposite of what I had had. That's why I think I was extra tolerant, perhaps, because I knew that he didn't have the feeling within him. Maybe having early love gives you a certain control. Dana discussed the event with Theda Curry, the historian at Bolton Landing. She, of course, cleaned up the mess and everything, Curry said. And when he came back later, soaking wet, she said a couple of stevedores on the docks had pulled him out of the river. She thought whatever reason he had jumped in the river for, she made kind of light of it, that he certainly got cooled off quickly. She thought he did it in plain sight, or some, so someone would, would certainly see him. Now, this is one of those incidents, after having read or heard it, is not easily forgotten. It's important. It has to be in the book. But we know the incident only through Daner. We don't have a specific context, such as what happened earlier that day, or what happened between them on previous days. We don't know how the incident was discussed afterward, if it was discussed. We don't know how Smith informed his mother about his marriage and how he internalized the relief and guilt that he must have felt about his parents not being able to attend the wedding. Should I write the story in the third person, something like, a week after he and Dana were married in an unassuming ceremony, Smith returned to their West Village apartment from his courses at the League, a few hours before he would begin his night shift as a taxi driver. To celebrate their marriage, Golda sent ingredients for a feast. Dana, since high school a confident cook, prepared the chicken and sweet potatoes and ruffles and placed the generous and hearty Midwestern meal on their table, which she set with their nicest tablecloth and silverware. Come to dinner, she said. For the first time, she was confronted with his volcanic emotions and his tormented relationship with his mother. He bumped the table and knocked over the glass of milk. No booze. This was prohibition. Oh, David, Daner said. He ripped out the tablecloth. Food, plates, glasses, everything flew through the room. Smith bolted the apartment, ran two blocks to the Hudson River, and jumped in. Two longshoremen relaxing by their barge fished him out. They asked where he lived. He told them. They took him home. He stood silent and immobile as Dana removed the clothes from his trembling body. He did not take a warm bath, but went into the bedroom and covered himself with blankets. For nearly an hour, Dana sat motionless in the kitchen. Then she finished cleaning up. Or do I leave the story in Dana's words? knowing that key aspects of her personality will come through, including her ability to talk in such a way so as to make the people to whom she was speaking feel they were members of her family. If I leave the story in her words, it's harder to write what I could surmise about it. Are my embellishments wrong? Is your first question, do they help or hurt the story? If readers learn that my presumptions include errors, would they trust the book less? To what degree do you expect biography to be fiction? How does Smith speak in this story? Does not hearing his voice deepen your experience of his shame and rage? My predisposition is always to leave an incident in the words of the teller. Sometimes I have to fight this. 
I will let Daner be the primary voice here. And how do I respond to the footnote in art historian and art critic Rosalind Krauss's 1971 monograph on Smith, Terminal Ironworks, the sculpture of David Smith, the only reference to the event in the Smith literature? Krauss had interviewed Daner. As an adult in a frenzied reaction to a reprimand by his first wife, Krauss wrote, Smith attempted suicide. Do I see Daner's response as a reprimand? I see it as a mix of alarm and disappointment. Do I believe his throwing himself in the river was an attempted suicide? Smith was a good swimmer. If he did not want to be rescued, he wouldn't have been. Given the temperature of the river, clearly he was rescued quickly. For me, the agonized sentence in, Dan in Daner's narration is, I hope he had seen them. Sixty years after the incident, her anxiety about it persisted. However the story is told, Smith's disturbed relationship with his mother will emerge. Readers will respond to the anecdote through their own histories. I did not want the extremeness of his reaction to obscure his ambivalence. The anecdote to which I'll devote the rest of this talk to is one I've been obsessed with. Like most of the compelling Smith anecdotes that are not elaborated by him, this one feels like a remnant or a relic, to use Walter Benjamin's language. My challenge as a writer is to consider its sights and follow its clues and to awaken the energies within it. With this anecdote, too, the catalytic voice is Daner's. She inserted it into the Smith literature in her official Smith interview with Krauss and Garnett McCoy for the Archives of American Art a few months after Smith's death. McCoy asked if teachers were impressed with Smith. Dana responded, he did tell me that when he was three years old, he was being punished when he was a little boy and taken because he used to run away and he was tied to a tree with a length of rope so that he wouldn't run off and there was a mud puddle there, and he made a lion out of mud when he was three years old. And it was so remarkable and so lion-like that his mother was delighted with it and called in the neighbors to look at this wonderful lion that little David had done. And he told me he got the idea of the lion from pictures he had seen in his grandmother's Bible, which he still had up in Bolton Landing. And there were pictures, tiny pictures of ruins in Egypt and so on, and hieroglyphics, and that's how he got the idea of the lion. And he remembered that, McCoy asked. And he remembered doing that, oh yes. And that was his first sculpture, of course. In 1987, in an interview with Maureen Bloomberg and Patricia Rennick, Daner told the story again. She said that during her first visit to Paulding in 1932, she didn't meet Smith's parents until five years after their marriage. Smith's mother, Smith's mother remembered very fondly and told me that David had a habit of running to his grandmother's house. He adored his grandmother, so she'd tie a long length of rope to him to a tree. He could run over their property, but he couldn't go down to grandmother's, to grandma's, or up. He was there, and under the tree was a mud puddle. David was three, and he molded a lion in the mud, from the mud, and Mother Smith saw it, and she was so excited. She was very appreciative of this, and she called in the neighbors to look at it, she told me this story herself. I asked him where he got the idea, he said, from my grandmother's Bible. Then at some point he decided that the Bible should be him when we were out in Paulding and he took it with him because he did love his grandmother. And in the back were some colored photographs or lithos or something. I don't know how they illustrated in those days, what technique, but they were pictures of Assyrian lions, those Assyrian things. He was very struck with those. And there were some architectural things, too, that were exhibited. There must have been six or seven pages of that. In print, Smith mentioned the mud lion once. In Sculpture Is, a stream of consciousness style prose poem he wrote in early 1947 for the catalog of his exhibition at Manhattan's Willard Gallery. Sculpture Is begins. My year AD 4, God and Father, moving forms, ice cream, flower odors, fears. Year 5 is a single incident, praise from a grandmother for a mud pie lion. Year 6, the specter human-headed bird, the soul of Ani, revisiting the, the body, 
seven, the found book of nude marble women hidden by a school teaching Methodist mother. No other years are mentioned. The poem's last lines are, sculpture is the dialectic of survival, everything I sought, everything I seek, what I will die not finding. The story of the mud line is irresistible in its archetypal mix of captivity and resourcefulness, trauma and creativity. But what do we do with it? How do we interpret a spectral fragment that we know only through its tellings? An event Smith referred to in print only in that fragment. We don't know when, how often, or in one cir what circumstances Smith told Dana the story. We don't know for how long, on that or any other day, Smith was tied up. No photograph will come along to help us determine the size, attitude, or look of the lion, or what happened to it. In one of Daner's tellings, the lion was inspired by an Egyptian image, in the other, an Assyrian one. In Sculpture Is, Smith is two years older than in Daner's recollections. In Smith's reference, the decisive recognition comes not from Mother Smith, but from his maternal grandmother, Catherine Stoller. So can this story be written as a straightforward narrative, something like chronically fearful at home, feeling safer in the house of his maternal grandmother, Smith ran away so often that Golda believed she had no choice but to tie him to the elm tree in their backyard. On one occasion after she put a rope around him, not long after the birth of his sister Catherine, Golda went on an errand. Unable to join his grandmother, but feeling connected to her through the images of animals in her, the family Bible, Smith stopped crying and sat in the mud. Over the next hour, he modeled a lion. When Golda returned, she was so impressed by its realism that she invited her neighbors to see what her son had made. Eager to prove to her mother that David was not oppressed, that his imagination was free at home, Golda invited her as well. Catherine, too, heaped praise on the boy. Dana would tell this story to his first wife, Dorothy Dana. She agreed that this was his first sculpture. The story encourages foundational insight into Smith's life and work. The mud lion can be seen as a dramatic response to subjugation by a civic-minded, do-gooder Methodist mother who did not have the, the means to deal with her son's unruly energy and discomfort with her. In a situation defined by desire for his grandmother's refuge and his mother's forcible detainment, he modeled the sculpture of the king of the jungle, an assertion of unmistakable but exotic animality that was less threatening than his real life wildness. The mud lion emerged as a result of Smith's openness to the materials at hand. It lived outdoors. The admiration for it let him know that his sculptural imagination was more palatable to the rest of his family in the sublimated language of art than it is periodic drastic behavior. His mother may not have known how to cope with him or how to come to terms with his desire to flee her, but she could admire what he had made. But these observations about the origins of the thwarted, embattled, and heroic artist, while undoubtedly important, only begin to suggest what an engagement with this anecdote can offer. Why did Smith write The Mud Lion into his work in 1947? What was going on around the time he wrote Sculpture Is? For Smith, as, as, as for much of the country, the World War II years were brutal. Materials and food were scarce. He had little time for art. It wasn't until 1944, when he was 38, that he learned he would not be drafted. From 1942 to 1944, six months of which he spent on the graveyard shift, he worked building tanks and locomotives at the American Locomotive Company in Schenectady, New York. After he and Dana returned to Bolton Landing in 1944, Smith had his first dramatic outburst of sculptural creativity. In mid-1945, after months of living with his volcanic distress, Dana went to New York City, leaving him for the first time. She saw a psychologist and encouraged him to see one as well, which he did for one or two sessions. Like many other artists of his generation, Smith began exploring his roots. 
He struggled to define his own identity in a post-war world struggling to create, recreate itself, to begin again, a world in which reality had been so drastically altered that artists of his talent and ambition had no choice but to reinvent themselves in their work. The Smith biographical sketch that ends with 1947 was part of this investigation. Psychoanalysis in art anthologized several essays on children, including one on the child-parent relationship. I'm not sure that the marks in the margins of these essays are Smith's, they could be Daner's. I am sure that the marks in the margins of the Chris essay are his. Near the beginning, Chris emphasized the importance of childhood events. The very fact that certain themes of human conflict are recurrent wherever men live, or where communal cultural conditions prevail, that from Sophocles to Proust, the struggle against incestuous impulses, against guilt and aggression, has remained a topic of Western literature, seems after almost half a century as well established as any thesis in the social sciences. Nor does it any longer seem doubtful that what a man has experienced in his early childhood may, without his knowing it, become a recurrent subject, not only of his dreams, but also of his creative work. At the beginning of Approaches to Art, Chris wrote that psychoanalysis today abolishes the spurious division between individual and social psychology. He cited Freud's reference to the great intuitive teachers of mankind, the philosophers, writers, and poets, the few to whom it is vouchsafed with hardly any effort to salve from the whirlpool of their emotions the deepest truth to which we others have to force our way, ceaselessly groping among torturing uncertainties. Artists could hear in this that their efforts to explore their own identities could have interpersonal or even universal significance. Krauss wrote that in 1946, Daner introduced Smith to Dr. Bernard Gluck, a former analysand of Freud who summered near Glens Falls, which is half an hour from Bolton Landing. The analyst and Smith became good friends. According to Daner's report, Dr. Gluck spent hours with Smith in his studio while Smith worked and they talked together. When Smith wrote Sculpture Is, he was clearly thinking about psychoanalysis and Freud. In his first published essay in 1940 on abstract art, he had already described Freud as, quote, the greatest single influence on the theoretical side of art providing an analytical system for establishing the reality of the unconscious, the region of the mind from which the artist derives his inspiration. Smith visited Paulding in the summer of 1944. From his work as well as from his letters, we know that at this moment, Smith's feelings about his mother were bitter. The reference to mother in Spectres are the second of the three texts, wrote, three texts Smith wrote for that 1947 catalog is derisive. The mother's love, the ass's jaw, he wrote. That 1947 exhibition included the, sculptures, the sculp sculpture Spectre of Mother. His 1945 Pillar of Sunday is a two and a half foot tall columnar steel slab like a Christmas tree, the body of the frontal female figure is decorated, in this case with miniature sculptures evoking Sunday dinner, a wagon with two children, a garden, church, and a heart worn on a limb, or perhaps a sleeve. Perched on the head is a bird with a man's head, its wings outstretched, resembling an early airplane. The surface is swathed with red paint. The figure seems forbidding, but cut into, impaled. It is in this work that Smith transformed a Christian idol into a totem. When a lover of Smith's passed by it with her daughter and me in Smith's 19, 2006 centennial retrospective at the Guggenheim, she couldn't look at it. There's too much pain in it, she said. Given the mix of longing and violation expressed here, it's not hard to understand Smith's excising of his mother from his mud lion reference while singling out his grandmother's praise. Smith told Freeze that the person who admired the mud lion was his grandmother. But since his grandmother lived several blocks away, she could probably only have learned about the mud lion from Golda. So in all likelihood, Golda was the first to approve of it. What about the Assyrian versus Egyptian question? 
Since in the late 40s, Smith made a number of sculptures inspired by Egyptian art, which is in some ways similar to Assyrian art. Does the answer matter? Isn't the most useful insight that Smith's earliest art historical imagination did not come from classical and Hellenistic Greece, but from older and more hieratic cultural traditions, pre-Christian ones, in which sculpture was defined by frontality, planarity, and a powerful awareness of figure ground relationship, relationships, and by a belief that sculpture was essential to the celebration of matter and image and to the ceremonializing of cruelty and deliverance. His grandmother's Bible, which Smith stole, may yet resurface. Since Assyrian sculpture includes some of the most unforgettable images of lions in the history of art, including the heroically wounded lioness in the 7th century BC relief in the British Museum, I'm quite sure the biblical source was Assyrian. Several times Smith refers to cuneiform, a form of writing as image that is more Assyrian than Egyptian. Assyrian cuneiform, where water is the parent of all things, where universal darkness reigns, where gods have been forgotten, is a phrase in sculpture is. In 1951, Smith wrote, I was trained in the cubist world concept, but before I could read, had pondered over cuneiform. My first conscious interests were the illustrations in the Bible of cuneiform, which impressed me more than the word language I later learned to read. I have always been more Assyrian than Cubist. How old was Smith when he made the mud lion? It's conceivable that he told Daner that he was three, and then after introspection, perhaps after talking with Gluck, decided that it occurred when he was five. At five, however, he would have been more likely to be conscious of and able to act on his connection with images in his grandmother's Bible. It was during his fifth year, 1911, that his sister Catherine was born. Given the arrival of a competing family member, his need for attention, and his mother's discomfort with his masculinity, which both Daner and Fries corroborated, his sister's birth could have made him feel even more threatened. The reference to cuneiform is a clear indication that sculpture is, is a creation myth. By omitting his first three years, Smith turns them into a black hole, from whose darkness the sculpture emerges. My year AD4, God and Father, moving forms, ice cream, flower odors, fears. Five, praise from a grandmother from a mud pie, for a mud pie lion. Six, the specter-headed, human-headed bird, the soul of Ani revisiting the, the body. Seven, the found book of nude marble women hidden by a school-teaching Methodist mother. He evokes the authority of both parents. In year four, God his father is unreachable, then the mud lion, then his mother, who is by contrast too close. Year seven suggests a battle between son and mother, between his budding desire and her determination to closet images stoking it. I'm not sure how to read the soul of Ani in the chronology. The Ani is a cuckoo bird of the American tropics, almost entirely black, 12 to 14 inches long. The cuckoo appears in the Bible and in myth. After year seven, the next lines are filled with characteristically esoteric and visceral and it filled with a characteristically esoteric and visceral mix. The next lines are Diana of the Ephesians, Egyptian embalmers in the sepulchral barge, women who utter cries, beat their breasts, tear their hair. The cuneiform of Nebuchadnezzar, and the fight between the monster Tiamat, personification of chaos, darkness, disorder, evil, and Marduk, god of light. The story of Tiamat and Marduk comes from the Sumerian Enuma Elish. It is, I think, the most important creation myth in this text because of its cosmic reach and the brutality with which, in the words of Edward S. Casey, Marduk's arrow, symbol of his phallic manhood, invades the womb matrix. Death penetrates to the seed of life. Only by destroying an organic matrix, source of generation, can the inorganic work of building proceed. The story of Tiamat and Marduk need, needs an attention that I can't give it here, that I cannot give it here. 
There are hints of creation myths and sculptures made as the war was ending or just after. The lower level of the great 1945 Jurassic bird is an image of the primal mud or muck from which life began. In the heart of the 25 inch tall and 33 inch long sculpture, just above the steel tracery of interlocking serpents, looking a bit like aortic sculpt structures, are two rambunctiously animated winged phallic and cannon shaped lungfish, whose position on a ledge makes it seem as if they're standing on a swing. swing had, Smith had pasted into a notebook an article called Longfish, it has not changed in 300 million years. The creatures survive because they develop not only lungs, but also legs, and eventually evolved into the first animals which could live out of water. A living fossil, it is the same today as it was 300 million years ago. At the top of the sculpture, attached to two vertical poles as if on a spit, is a horizontal fossil with a tail, two hind feet, and a fish neck and head. The feet resemble gesturing hands, which make the table seem like the tail seem like a head. The fossil seems both upside down and right side up and facing in two directions. It suggests a pre prehistoric bird, but its ribs bring to mind the ruins of an ancient ship, perhaps a slave galley, and the upright collarbone suggests a gibbet or mast. The ribs also resemble pistons. The phallic cannon lungfish that emerged 300 million years ago are not only still present in this landscape of extinction, they are as, live as, as alive as they were then. In Smith's work, the primeval past, like the most primitive parts of the self, is ever present. Nothing is more haunting in the tellings of this story than their silences. In neither of Daner's narrations is there criticism of Golda's behavior. To Golda, who like Harv had grown up with a frontier mentality, her act seems to have been natural. Your boy threatens to run away, you leash him to a tree like a dog or a horse, any parent would do it, certainly a mother with a son like David Smith. Dana was empathetic with Smith's unhappiness as a child. She mentioned it to Krauss, she mentioned to Krauss and McCoy, the scars on his body, and astute in her analysis of the impact on him of his experiences of childhood injustice. But during her report of Golda's telling, she does not ask, how could Golda have done this? What did his grandmother offer him that his mother and father couldn't? Perhaps the lack of scrutiny of an abusive act can be explained by the knowledge that Daner, like Fries, was abused by Smith, and that Bochy and, da and Golda felt at the mercy of his rages. Can we be sure that the lion is purely a surrogate for Smith? In his essay, Art and Anxiety, published in Partisan Review in 1945, Robert Gorham Davis wrote about a case study by Anna Freud in her book, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense. In his fantasies, this lad was attended by a tame lion, very fierce in demeanor. When grown-ups of his acquaintance first saw it, they were terrified, but their terror changed to wonder when they found the beast completely submissive to the boy's command. Although he was not aware of the connection, a train of associational patterns made it clear that the lion was his father, and that the fantasy gave the boy relief by letting him imagine himself in complete control of a person whose behavior actually filled him with confusion and anxiety. And if we assign jungle or bush its usual meaning in Freudian symbolism, the cautionary sentence if you go into the jungle, a lion will eat you, may be read as a threat from the father in the Oedipal situation. Golda's leashing of her son seems so peculiar as to be anomalous, but was it? Describing Raymond Carver's small town childhood in the 1940s in the state of Washington, biographer Carol Sklenecker wrote that the great short story writer's mother, Ella, literally kept Raymond on a tight leash. When he, grew up, one, when he grew up, one friend listened in amazement as he egged his mother on to tell stories about his early childhood. One of them was about taking him into a town on a leash. She never broke character because that was her character. If you said, a leash, she said without irony. Well, of course I had to keep him on a leash. Toward the end of the book, Sklenecker wrote that Carver, 
who for years would be a catastrophic and to his first wife an occasionally abusive alcoholic, promised Knopf a new book of short stories to be edited by Gottlieb. This commitment he regarded as being back in harness, as opposed to the freedom of writing poems that he'd enjoyed since he turned in cathedral in 1983. I like a harness, by the way. I think it's the thing for me, he wrote Tobias Wolf. Preparing this talk, I began wondering how an anecdote that in Smith's writing exists as the briefest of phrases could hold my attention for, long as one, for as long as one of his sculptures or paintings. I wondered, has my not leaving this story somehow been orchestrated by Smith? During her visit to Bolton Landing in 1952, Krasny asked Smith about his childhood. In her, notes, in her notes on that visit, she wrote, about the earliest incident he recalls is that when he was five, he met a mud lion with both, which both his grandmother and mother praised. His mother, he said, was never able to hide a book of Greek sculpture from him, though her Puritan instincts probably made her try. So in 1952, the praise came from both mother and grandmother. That he told the story to Krasny is an indication that he wanted more from it. By declaring it the earliest incident he remembered, he gave it a primacy that ensured that she would record it. Daner certainly remembered it. 1947 to 52 was the period in which Smith spoke about after images. He made sculptures that, that turned script into images. He offered few details about his life but made sure that events in his life, like his work, would exert a persistent archaeological pressure, bubbling up near the surface of consciousness, waiting for the process of excavation to be continued. Thank you. <clears throat> So I don't know if you have responses or comments and questions, but if you do, I'd love to hear them. Yes. It seems from your presentation that you answered the question that you threw out to us, that this just <laughs> immense complexity and the most responsible job is to tease out all the nuance. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that I, I think that what I find is that the, you know, first of all, you see it and it's like a detail that just catches your mind and doesn't go away, <clears throat> and then you and then you realize that there are all these questions and that all their problems that ask. And I think part of the interesting thing for, you know, for a scholar or an artist and anyone else is to realize that those questions are, are possibilities, and uh, and and if you and if you follow them bit by bit. That, that something opens up for you that you had no way of, of knowing. But I think the, I, one of the larger questions I have with this is this is a biography. So, so how does this, which makes it it's sort of you know, doubly difficult, how, do, how does this stuff, how does this incident get in the book? And uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think there must be a possibility for different kinds of writing. But is there a possibility for this kind of writing? And if I write, if this, if I decide this occurred in 1911, when I'm talking about his childhood, do I? How much of this other stuff can I bring in? And I don't have an answer to it. Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's I think a little bit to suggest to you sort of the problems of biography, and uh, because it seems to me, if for any biographer, you know, worth his or her salt, you you realize the the kinds of issues that emerge, and then how do you deal with them? And I don't think you have to deal with these all the way through because you'd never write anything. But I, I think I think that there there are a handful of of incidents or events that are that are that are so telling uh, that like I, I have to find a way to deal with this outside of uh, of a straightforward narrative, which as you can see is just too limited. But I think I think there's a tendency in a biography you would just write about this as an event that happened in 1911, and and maybe you interpret it. 
you, you'd kind of take off from it, but then all the, none of this other stuff can come in. So I, I don't really know the answer to it. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it seems like part of the strength of this is the way it opens up, and uh, you know, as much as the way it closes down. But I think part of what I why I'm, I, I want to talk about this is that I think biography is so much a part of this culture, and I think there's so much that's taken for granted in biographical information, uh, you know, in a reality television confessional culture, and or in political anecdotes. And so all this stuff, when you start to think about it, is kind of a mess. And, um, and, and how, do we, how do we actually, and it's so corrupted, that, that how do you actually get, to the, get back to the point where the, the potential value, the, the need for stories is there in a way that, you know, that people can use and, and believe in. So you know, it's a little bit what's behind this talk, the, the, the whole issue of biography and anecdote in the, in, in the larger culture. Well, I, I certainly felt the need to spend a lot of time thinking about her. Um, but that's, you know, you raise a, a, a great question because, uh, I mean, I have to be able to let the reader know where she's coming from. Because uh, in a way, she's like, her, her voice is, is totally compelling. Uh, she's a great storyteller. She wants people to listen to her. So how do I how do I deal with that and and um, and it's something that that made me crazy. It made me crazy that 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 I know so much about their life together only through her, and it's not that her voice isn't reliable; it's very reliable. But I still it's like these. Where is he? You know, it's like 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 how do the between her voice, between my voice, between other people's voices? How do you know how does Smith come through? How does his voice you know begin to? to speak, and, uh, and I have all this information about Dana. I have a whole biographical section on her, but it disturbed me that I really only know that through her, you know, through maybe 15 interviews. So how do I write that? Do I just, do I just tell that like third person? I can't do that. I mean, I think the easiest thing to do is just say at the beginning that this is where the information comes from, like a two-paragraph introduction that it, comes, that it comes from her, and I'm not going to cite her uh, all the way through, although I probably have to cite the different interviews, the different moments. But yeah, this question of the, of the authority of the voice and where the voice comes from, it's something that, uh, that I can't take for granted. Yes? Um, I really, I don't do much of it. I, I think, I, because I don't, I don't, I, I'm very wary of any kind of interpretive system that, that can lock down, you know, anyone, particularly an artist as complex as Smith is. But I, and, and so I don't know even, I don't know if I even offer interpretations. But I, I think some of this comes through Smith and comes through other voices. But but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna project uh, like an overall psychoanalytic structure. Even though I I think that Freudian one was one he believed in. I mean I think Totem and Taboo is a really important book for him. But I think I can deal with these as they, as they go along and not and not try to um, you know he fought his whole life against being boxed in. Uh, that's part of, you know, he fought against boundaries. That's part of what made, made him a great artist and made him so difficult to live with. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm wary of creating another, uh, another boundary uh, uh, around him. But nevertheless, I have to be able to use a kind of insight uh, when it's there and when it's available for him, to me. But I'm not going to make that much of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> your own personal take on, on 
Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And uh, I almost think the, the key to your answer is a, is a degree of skepticism that a kind of not willing, uh, an unwilling, or at least a, a, a reluctance to take things for granted and to really consider sources, times, you know, all that other stuff. And, and I think by following through on this for me, and partly why I keep coming back to it, is that I do feel this has opened up a great deal for me. Uh, I feel like just by following that little anecdote, like a whole moment has opened up in Smith's life and also a, a larger way of understanding him. So it's where, you know, these really little things sometimes can just become enormous in their, in their ramifications. And that's, it's been a, a real source, continuous source of discovery for me. Yeah, again, it, 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 it's a good question because if maybe if, if one spends a lot of time with any artist, you, you ask the question, where does this come from? Uh, I mean, I had, I, I don't know if I ever, I mean, I, I had questions that I've been concerned with for a while, which is how did he, how did he from, from Decatur, Indiana, and Paulding, Ohio, come to have an idea that art could be this for him, you know, like, where did this come from? So, and that's the question that's, that's occupied me more. So what is it that made him want to go to New York and uh, to be an artist? Like, where is it, where's that information? You know, uh, how is that built into a culture? How, how the hell does he know that? And uh, so that's the question that occupied me more than, than a, like a question of, of almost exact origins uh, like that. And, and, um, but in other words, the question, the, the questioning about why he was an artist is always there. And, and that would inevitably feed back in a, into this. And it is so archetypal, which is, I think, why he, he built it. You know, uh, it just fills, it fits into, you know, it, f it fits into so many um, uh, frames. But I, I, I think you're absolutely right to point out that, that the, the prevalence of that, of that question uh, and why at a certain point writing this book inevitably one is going to lock on to that particular fragment. Um, well, he taught at Sarah Lawrence, but that was that was that was after this between forty eight and fifty, and Campbell taught there. Uh, and I think Fries might have even taken a course with him. I'm I'm not sure, but but he was definitely around. He, you know, you're you're right though. He's definitely around the abstract expressionists, uh, and he was there. I think you know, in relation, I feel like in relation to your question that. This comes together in a, in a paper, and maybe it, it seems to fit together, but it really comes together over time. Uh, what I'm writing here, I mean, basically I started thinking about this maybe four years ago, and then there was a little piece of it. And then, and then each time I go back to it, more emerges uh, in, in, a, in a kind of puzzle. So there's a temporal aspect, a temporality to the discovery of it. Um, that's interesting and it kind of comes back to your question about the way in which you relate to material and, and the way in which themes, even archaeologically, you know, they keep getting unearthed. But this is, this is over time. 
although I probably won't do that much more with it, but, but I'm really eager to see what, you know, people here and, and elsewhere, whether what your reactions are, whether there are aspects of the story that you don't buy, or whether you, there are other aspects that you see that you think, you know, I could do more with. Okay, you've been great, thank you. <clears throat>